In this video, I'll be demonstrating how to use Blender to make this animation of text with a bright light in the background. I'll be using Blender version 2.71. Let's start by creating a new project. So from the File menu, select New, and then click on Reload Startup File. Next, right-click on the cube to make sure that it's selected, and then delete it by pressing X. Now let's add some text. So press Shift-A and select Text. I'll zoom in to see it better. To make the text stand up, we'll rotate it on the x-axis. So press R, then X, then 90, then Enter. To edit the text, press Tab to enter edit mode. Now use the backspace key to delete the text and enter in your own text. Then press Tab to return to object mode. Next, let's add some thickness to the text. So click on the Object Data button. I'm going to use an extrude value of 0.1. Next, let's bevel the edges by entering a bevel depth value. I'm going to use 0.02. Then set the resolution to 3 to round out and smooth the beveled edges. Now I'm going to increase the spacing between the letters. To do that, come down to the Paragraph section and change the letter spacing to 1.4. Next, let's set the material for the text. So click on the Material button. Then click New. Now come up here and change this from Blender Render to Cycles Render. Then click the Use Nodes button. Set the surface type to Anisotropic. You may need to scroll to bring the Anisotropic shader into view. Now click here to set the color. If you want to use the same color that I'm using, then click the hex button and enter 001679. This will give us a blue color. Next, set the roughness to 0.2. Now press 5 on the number pad to switch from perspective to orthographic view. Then press 1 on the number pad to switch to front view. I'll zoom in a little. Now let's add a floor for the text to sit on. So press Shift A and select Mesh, and then Plane. I'll rotate the view a little so that you can see it better. Then scale it up in size by pressing S, then 15, then Enter. Now press 1 on the number pad to switch to front view. Then grab the arrow and move the floor until it's at the bottom of the text. Next, let's set the material for the floor. So click the New button. I'm going to keep the diffuse surface type. Click here to set the color and enter 303030. This will give us a dark gray color. Now let's set up the lighting. So zoom out until you can see the lamp and then right click on it to select it. Next press G and use the mouse to move the lamp to the center of the text. Now press 7 on the number pad to switch to top view. Then drag the lamp behind the text. I'm pulling mine back until the distance between the lamp and the text is about the same distance as the width of the text. Now zoom out until you can see the edges of the floor, and then right-click on it to select it. Then grab the arrow and drag the floor until it's overlapping the lamp by just a little bit. Next, press 1 on the number pad to switch to front view and zoom in. I'll rotate the view so you can see this a little better. Now right-click on the lamp to select it. Then click on the Object Data button if it's not already selected. Make sure that the point lamp is selected and the size is set to 0.1. The smaller the size is, the sharper the edges of the shadows will be. Now click on the Use Nodes button and set the Strength value to 10,000. To get an idea of what this looks like so far, click the Viewport Shading menu and select Rendered. You'll notice that the reflection on the side of the R is only reflecting a small area. You can see the same thing on the upper flat part of the D. So to make the reflections look better, right-click on the text to select it. To make sure that it's selected, you can locate it in the outliner and then verify that text is highlighted. Now click the Object Modifiers button. Then click Add Modifier and select Edge Split. Now the text is reflecting light the way that I would expect it to. Next, let's make the background color darker. 
so click on the World button. Then click the color and set the hex value to 252525. Now is a good time to save what I've done so far, so from the File menu, I'll select Save As. I'm going to name this Brightstar.blend. Now we're going to add the bright light source that will be seen in the background. The lamp that we set up earlier is being used to light our scene and to create the shadows, but it's not directly visible in the rendered image. So now we're going to add a different light source that will be visible in the background. The new light source is going to be a sphere, and we want it to be located at about the same position as our lamp. To do that, select Solid from the Viewport Shading menu. Then right click on the lamp to select it. Then press Shift S and select Cursor to Selected. This will move the 3D cursor to the lamp. Now press Shift A and select Mesh, and then UV Sphere. Then shrink it down in size by pressing S, then point .05, then Enter. Then grab the green arrow and move it back until it's just a little bit behind the lamp. This will prevent the sphere from blocking the lamp. Next, let's set the material for the sphere. So click on the Material button, and then click New. Change the surface type to Emission. You may need to scroll to bring the Emission Shader into view. The Emission Shader emits light, and the Strength value controls the intensity. Set the Strength value to 1000. This value will make the sphere the brightest object in the scene. We'll keep the color set to white. Now let's set up the camera view, so press 0 on the number pad. This is the view looking through the camera. I'll zoom in a little. Now let's lock the camera to the view. To do that, press N to open the Properties panel, and put a check mark next to Lock Camera to View. Then press N again to close the Properties panel. Now I can zoom, pan, and rotate while looking through the camera. Now during the animation, we're going to be zooming and rotating the camera. In order to keep the text centered while doing this, we can set up the camera to track the center of the text. To accomplish this, I'll first place an empty object at the center of the text, and then set up the camera to track the empty object. So press Shift A, and select Empty, and then Plane Axes. The empty object doesn't contain any geometry, so it will not be visible in our final render. It just represents a point in space. Now I'll press 1 on the number pad to switch to front view. Then use the arrows to position the object at the center of the end if it's not there already. Next, press 3 on the number pad to switch to right side view and zoom out until you can see both the text and the empty object. Then use the arrows to position the empty object at the center of the text. Now press 0 on the number pad to switch to camera view. Next we're going to set up the camera to track the empty object. So find the camera in the outliner and click on it to select it. Then click on the Constraints button. Next click on Add Object Constraint and select Track To. Then click in the entry box to display a list of objects that we can track and select Empty. The camera axis that we want to point towards the empty object is the minus Z axis, so click the minus Z button. Then change the up value to Y. Now the empty object will stay centered in the camera view. You can see this if I rotate the view. If you wanted the camera to be centered on a different location, then all you need to do is to move the empty object to a different location. Now let's set up the animation. So rotate the view until the light is on the right side of the text. The light should also be a little below the top of the last letter in the text. I'm going to zoom out a little. This will be the starting point of the animation. Now we're going to set a keyframe for the camera. So find the camera in the outliner and make sure that it's selected. Then make sure that the frame number is set to frame 1. Now put the mouse cursor over the camera view window and press I. Then select Location Rotation. Now the location and rotation of the camera is set for frame 1. If I move the time cursor, you can see that there is a yellow line at frame 1, which means that a keyframe has been set for that frame. 
Now set the frame number to 100. Then zoom in and rotate the view until the light source is in between the B and the L. Then press I and select Location Rotation. Next, set the end frame for the animation to 120. Now if you click on the play button, you can watch how the animation will move. Next, select Rendered from the Viewport Shading menu so that we can see what this looks like as a rendered image. I'm going to save what I've done so far. Now we're going to set up the background light to look like a very bright light. We'll be adding some light streaks to this sphere by using a glare filter. So from the Screen Layout menu, select Compositing. Make sure that the Compositing button is selected and then add a check mark next to Use Nodes. I'll expand this area to give us more room to work. I can also close this Properties panel by pressing N. This is the Render Layers node and it's currently outputting our render layer. The Composite node is used for our final output. In order to see what we're doing better, let's add a Viewer node. So press Shift A and select Output, and then Viewer. Then add a check mark next to Backdrop. Now whatever we connect to the Viewer node's image input will be displayed in this background area. So let's connect the Render Layer's image output to the Viewer image input. Now click the Render button to render the image, and the Viewer will display it in the background. If you want to zoom out on the background, then press V. You can zoom in by pressing Alt-V. We're going to apply a glare filter to the light in the background, but we don't want the glare filter to be applied to anything else. So we're going to use a math node to separate the light from the rest of the scene. So press Shift-A and select Converter, and then Math. Then move it over the connection between the Render Layers node and the Viewer and press the left mouse button to drop it into place. Since the light source is the brightest object in the scene, we're going to use the Greater Than function to separate it from the rest of the scene. So click here and select Greater Than. You may need to scroll to bring it into view. Now when you increase this value, you can see part of the scene disappear. So keep increasing it until the light source is the only thing visible. I'm going to set it to a little over 260. Next, let's add a glare filter. So press Shift A and select Filter, and then Glare. Then drop it on the connection between the math node and the viewer. Make sure that the type is set to Streaks. Change the iterations value from 3 to 5 to increase the accuracy. Then change the threshold value to 0. Now we can see the streaks. Next, change the number of streaks to 7. Now let's make the streaks longer by increasing the fade value. I'm going to increase it to 0.94. Now let's add another glare filter. An easy way to do that is to duplicate the glare filter that we already have. So press Shift D to duplicate it then drop it on the connection between the Glare Filter node and the Viewer. This not only added another Glare Filter, but it duplicated the settings as well. Now let's make a few changes to the Duplicate Glare Filter, so set the number of streaks to 8. Then let's rotate the streaks a little, so set the Angle Offset to 20. Now shorten the length of the streaks by setting the Fade value to 0.9. By the way, if you make a mistake and then undo the change by pressing Ctrl Z, the background image may disappear. If this happens, then just remove the check mark next to Backdrop and then put it back again. Now I'm going to make some extra room to work, so I'll click on this triangle to minimize the glare filter. I'll do it for the other one also. So what we have now is a light source with streaks at the output of this glare filter. If you connect the Render Layers node to the viewer, then you can see the scene without the light streaks. So now we're going to combine this view with the glare filter output. So press Shift-A and select Color, and then Mix. 
then drop it on the connection between the render layers node and the composite node. Then connect the output of this glare filter to the mix node input. Then to see what this looks like, connect the output of the mix node to the viewer. Now change the mix type to add. Now we have the light streaks included in the scene. Now is a good time to save what I have so far. Next, let's switch back to the default screen layout. Now let's set up some rendering options. So click on the Render button. Then open the Sampling section. This is where you can set the number of render samples. The larger this number is, the better the quality will be, but the longer it will take to render. I'm going to set the number of render samples to 50. Since we're going to be rendering 120 frames, I'm going to keep this value pretty low to help minimize the rendering time. Now come up to the Output section. This is where you set the directory where your animation will be saved. On my computer, the contents of this default temp directory are deleted when Blender closes, so be sure and select a different directory. To do that, click on this button and select a directory. Next, click here to set the file format. There are multiple movie formats that you can choose from. I'm going to use OGG Theora. Now we're ready to render the animation, but I'm going to save the project first. It's a good idea to save the project before rendering in case something goes wrong during the rendering process. To render the animation, click on the Animation button. If you want to abort the rendering before it's finished, then press the Escape key. Since this is going to take a while, I'm going to pause the video until it's done. The animation is done rendering now. This is the final frame that was rendered. If you want to return to the previous view, you can click this button and select 3D View. To view the animation, go to the Render menu and click on Play Rendered Animation. The animation will play through to the end and then start back at the beginning again. Now if you open up Windows Explorer or something equivalent, you can navigate to your movie file. Now assuming that you have a video player that will play the movie format that you specified, you can now play your movie. I've set up this player to repeat the video in a loop so that it will keep repeating. Well that concludes this video. Thanks for watching, and please subscribe and leave a comment.